Because even if it's compressed, it's not going to stop this. Right? Could you describe what you don't like? About this tree? Mm -hmm. Right now? Um, I'm not going to lie. This, this, this uh, design is going to be very complicated for me to pull off well. Mm -hmm. And so as I'm sitting up here creating the branch structure and the framework for this, I'm racking my brain as to how I'm going to make this work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but what I don't like about this tree, I don't like the fact that this tree is so long at the top. It has a lot of length, right? A lot of distance. And the farther that we compress this tree, the angle that this bend occurs at, right, naturally, we cannot go against this bend. The angle that this occurs at is towards the direction that we want to reduce the length of the tree from. What do you do, right? You can either try to go against it and suffer the repercussions, which is definite breakage, or you can work with it and see how far you can push this tree to bring it back on itself. So you guys are going to get to kind of see something special here today. Yeah pushing, probably pushing the limits of what's realistic to some extent, but I won't push the limits of the health of the tree. So if we come up with a crappy product, that's all on me. Um, Did Cal Poly have any classes in both sides? Cal Poly. By the time I got there, they didn't. Right? They used to be a very specialized horticultural school, mm -hmm. and at one time they did have bonsai classes, um, but the state of California and the Cal, let's see, Cal Oh, yeah, Cal State um, uh, Education Board or whatever, whoever dictates the policy in those organizations said, you guys have gone off the reservation in terms of um, what's appropriate for a horticultural uh, university. And so when I was there, I happened to stumble upon the remnants of a bonsai course, and I got like, I don't know, 30 branch vendors and a bunch of tools, none of which anybody wanted anyway, so it wasn't like some big score. But when you're a bonsai junkie, it's like free tools. Oh. <laughs> so I was excited about it. But um, one of the things I did have the opportunity to do when I was at Cal Poly, which I thought was really, really awesome, um, they funded the money. They had a thing called enterprise projects. And enterprise projects were an opportunity for students to take an idea for an endeavor and experiment with that idea in terms of creating your own business seeing if you could realistically make it a viable, working, functioning, money-generating operation. And they gave me enough money to start my own bonsai nursery, <laughs> which was awesome. <laughs> and in fact, it actually generated some income, but um, it, was, it wasn't along, anything along the lines of what, what I'm doing now. So, uh, but that was a tremendous experience. But the education that I had in horticulture, I didn't realize that would pay off until I got to Japan. because. Immediate horticultural principles are not readily applicable to bonsai until you're trying to figure out why things happen. Why things happen. Now all of a sudden it's like, wait, doesn't a plant do this because of this and that? And you realize that it was a good, you know, however much money I ended up having to generate for college. You guys have any other questions? Fire away. Talking work. I'm curious about your apprenticeship. Um, you said that you, you, since you're an apprentice and you were basically you know, a doc or whatever, how did you get like, did he like pay you anything or did you get any kind of stipend or how did you survive, you know, with like coming back to the U.S. for occasions and that sort of thing? Um, Mr. Kimura, because he didn't want to house, when, when he first had apprentices when he was younger, um, in his 30s, he used to, the apprentices used to sleep and we had a workshop and in the workshop there was a meal room for the apprentices and that was, kind of back behind the workshop, and we would sit in there during lunch hour so that we didn't have to eat our food in front of clients or people didn't see apprentices eating. Um, and the apprentices used to roll out futons in there and sleep there, and they would bathe in Mr. Kamara's house, and uh, his wife would cook all of the meals for them. And it was, you know, a, a very typical situation, work, sleeping in the workshop and, and surviving under those conditions. However, um, just like just like anybody else, he reached a point where he didn't want that situation anymore. He didn't want people in his home. His daughters became teenagers, and uh, his wife grew tired of, of doing that. And so that was when he started moving apprentices off um, of the property. And so by the time I got there, 
there were no longer apprentices living there, and he had to realistically supply some sort of living expense to enable himself to have apprentices, otherwise people couldn't afford to be there. And so he provided us with the bare minimum, like the definition of bare minimum for what we needed, just slightly under the amount of money we needed to eat well every month. Mm. And he used to always say, a good apprentice is a starved apprentice. <laughs> how did you decide to go and study with him? How did I decide on Mr. Kamara? Yeah. I wanted to be the best. And uh, in my mind, there was no other option except him. And so, when I looked at my initial impression of Mr. Kamara, I, I got into bonsai, I used to play basketball, and I dedicated all of my energy to basketball. I worked at basketball uh, during the summer for 8 to 10 hours a day, and uh, was just obsessed with it, thought I'd be a collegiate basketball player, and I, I tore my quadricep muscle twice in half. And the second time that it happened, I was super depressed because I realized that dream was gone. And as I was sitting icing my leg two days after having done that, I was, I was bummed to no longer really compete collegiately at basketball. Um, a TV show came on, a little blip about Japanese culture, and uh, they had a bonsai tree on there. And I'd always thought the Karate Kid was cool, and there was a guy at the county fair that you know sold trees and whatnot. And so I was thinking, ah, oh, you know, that's cool. I'd like to try that. But it was like that moment when I had just I was at a low, like the low of all lows. Uh, one dream had been completely destroyed. Um, I saw a bonsai at that moment, and it was like all of that energy just shifted from basketball to bonsai. And uh, the next day I went to the library and checked out like 20-some books on bonsai. And two weeks later, a family friend um, was in a garden shop in Denver and saw uh, Bonsai Today. And she bought an issue of it for me. And in that issue of Bonsai Today, there was an article about Mr. Kimura styling a cascading juniper. And it's a tree that he still has today. Uh, and as I sat and looked at that, the uh, very first time I saw his work, uh, I knew that's who I wanted to be like wow. and study with. Um, but, you know, it's not like when you're sitting there looking at a magazine of somebody doing something that you don't really think is a reality for you to do, that you would ever comprehend the opportunity to, to go there, study with him, be that. And it was such a foreign idea that I never really gave it much hope. But I think... I think in the back of my head I always thought there was a chance that I could make that happen and um, the series of events that needed to take place for me to get to where I, where, where I got was um, pretty, pretty serendipitous and um, here I am. So, Mr. Kimura's trees, how does the, the ownership break down? What percentage are his and will never be sold? What percentage are owned by, by Mr. Big Bucks? How many are, are wannabes, wannabe owned by Mr. Bucks? Big Bucks? Um, Mr. Kamara probably owns 5% of the trees in his nursery, and I don't know if there's one that will never be sold. Um, and the rest of the trees are owned by clients who have some motivation to get those trees in a show or have Mr. Kamara develop them. And um, you have to keep in mind, both sides of business, right? It's a business. And this, this really taints things. This has been a, a very gray area for me coming back uh, because I've chosen to pursue something that I love, that I'm passionate about, that I want to see improve, not on a financial scale, but on a, on a level of appreciation and ability in the United States. However, when you make that decision, when I made that choice, although I was very ignorant to the fact that it would be jading my world, like the, the one pure thing I had, uh, you make a commitment to supporting yourself uh, with that same same clean endeavor, and uh, that always complicates things. And so, as I was an apprentice in Japan, there are some masters that give their apprentices a very clear perspective and idea of how they conduct business, and Mr. Kimura did not do that for us. Um, he basically made our world bonsai and bonsai only, and business was always separate. But for him, a uh, bonsai is a business, that's how he makes a living, and he definitely probably has more of a passion for bonsai than other professionals. He creates trees that he will not sell. Um, so when I said that I was kind of lying, he has creations, a lot of his rock creations, he will never pass on to anybody, um, and, and I, would, I wouldn't even be surprised to see him destroy those if he thought that he could no longer do bonsai. 
Um, but trees in general are things that allow him to continue to do what he loves to do. And so um, there's a very fine line there, but uh, the majority of the trees there are for sale, and the majority of the trees are clients' trees. How many trees that fail? In other words, the ones that possibly had potential, but it was decided that they did not have potential. They get sold. They get sold. Sold. Sold to a lesser clientele. Sold to somebody who will appreciate them. But Mr. Kimura functioned at the very upper level of bonsai in Japan. Any tree that came into our garden was potentially one of the best trees in the country. And so functioning on that level, he didn't have, although he, you know, at times, I'm sure Mr. Kimura would, like, would have liked to have worked on a lesser tree. His time was worth money. And he knew that his, if time was worth money and you're getting paid for what you're doing, it, it makes sense to take trees that you can generate and justify to spending that time with. You know, but there were times, I'll never forget one time when I was by myself and every night he kept saying, go home, go home. And when he would say go home, it generally meant, okay, we've got another two or three hours, right? <laughs> And he would say, go home, go home, and we'd be sitting there working and say, we, you know, you'd sit there and say, hi, 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 you know, we're going to go home, we're going to go home and keep working until finally he would yell, get out of here, and then you'd get up and say, okay, thank you, good night. But he kept saying, go home, go home, or don't come back tonight, because we would go home, fix dinner, and come back. Uh, and I called one of my older apprentices, because it was just me, and I didn't know what the heck that meant, and I said, you know, this is what he's saying to me every night, what do you think? And he said, what do you mean what I think? Go home. <laughs> you know, here, here for three years, go home means stay, and now it's all of a sudden, it's like I'm supposed to just pick that up. But anyways, um, I started going home, and I said, you know, why do you think he did that? And he said, he's just, you know, there are some times when, uh, just like anybody else, he wants to be alone and just in the workshop um, creating and whatnot and, and working without having the stress of an apprentice on his back, and, um, and that's what that meant that day, so... But he, 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 a lot of times when he would work on his own creations, he would um, tell us to, to tell us to leave. He just didn't want to be bothered. He just wanted to enjoy doing his own side. So I really found that to be admirable. Um, you know, there are a lot of there are a lot of masters that once they become a professional or bonsai becomes their means and mode of survival and income, that they no longer start. They no, no longer touch trees. They no longer work on trees. They have apprentices. They rely on their apprentices to do it. They go and travel and deal in business and whatnot, but they stop creating trees. Mr. Kimura has yet to stop creating a tree, and I think that that's really commendable. And, you know, people, people always say, what, what, you know, what makes him so good? And he's a genius. I mean, his IQ is, is, is literally, um, probably if you measured it, it would be a genius IQ, genius level IQ. But I think more than that, um, he had a work ethic that was second to none. I mean, he was in the workshop with us five out of the seven nights, six out of the seven nights until well past we left, you know, and we always went home at 11 o'clock or 11.30. He would be there till one or two. And uh, during the day, he would come out with a list of things to do, and you could tell when he came out of that door what kind of day it was going to be. It was going to be a hopscotch day or a hit with dodgeball day. And uh, some days it was really, really unpleasant to be there, but um, he, he was working hard all the time. <clears throat> you guys are getting to see some work here. Mm -hmm. Uh, they didn't come back to visit, no. Their own story. There's certain people that are welcome and certain people that aren't, and there aren't too many time people that are welcome. 
Hmm. How do you feel about the challenge of, of creating a bonsai in two hours out of a sort of a <laughs> material tree? Um, creating a bonsai in two hours. The, the, way, the way that I was educated to work um, was no different than what I'm doing right now. Uh, we Make no mistake, I mean, it, this was, again, this was a, a manner of business for us on a daily basis. And so we didn't take our time, we didn't have days that, or trees that took two or three days. When you got a piece of work from Mr. Kimura, it meant that you should have started wiring it an hour ago, right? <laughs> and it meant that it needed to be done yesterday. And so this type of work is, and this pace, is exactly how I pursue things at my own garden. It's exactly how I expect my apprentices to pursue things. And uh, it's no different than anything that I would do in my own garden. Right. <clears throat> so let me give you guys a little bit. We're starting to get there, starting to get some of the branches brought forward. We've reduced some of the length slightly, yeah? Mm -hmm. A little bit. Okay. Still not to where I want to be, but we're, we're working towards that goal. So I'm just kind of going to kind of keep inching forward, and we'll see how things come together as we continue to wire. Does anybody have any bright ideas for how to make this better? Hmm. Anything? Or are we kind of lost at the moment? Like, what is this going to be? Well, I have a, a, a. What's that? The branches are still too long. Still too long. Okay. Yeah. Um, I expect to. I display my ignorance as I, uh, uh, well, as I ask about this. On that one branch which you brought down and around, its its line is um, um, on the cross in the line of the trunk, mm -hmm. um, which in the classic rules is supposed to be a no-no. Mm. Um, <clears throat> at least I, I was always I was always told that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, it's clear you see no problem with it. Right. I was wondering if you'd want to comment on it at all. Um, I don't really see a problem with it. Okay. <laughs> 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 all right. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. That's right, a good question. So, uh, we have all of these books and we've got all of these things, and uh, it's, it's very common for Americans to say, ah, you know, I'm not going to follow the rules or something like that, and uh, I'm no different. No, I'm just kidding. I am. No, this, the reason that this works for me is because every time that we look at a tree and we see a tree that looks like it follows the rules, every time that we look at a tree and it looks like a tree that we've seen in a book, that's just recreating something that's been done. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's utilizing the characteristics of the tree that make it interesting, right? So sometimes when you have a tree where you can create something that may be considered a flaw, if you do it well, right, and that's not to say you just throw it on there and say, ha, yeah. did it, but if you can do it well, right, and you can pull it off, it becomes that much more interesting. And so for me, uh, coming back and starting to create my own bonsai and whatnot, sort of the thing that propels me and interests me <coughs> is doing something or trying to utilize the characteristics of the tree that are unique to that tree. So I've wired trees in Japan for six years. We would wire 340 trees a year maybe, maybe more. Yeah. And after you wire so many trees that don't have a branch that crosses the trunk, sometimes you start to think, I wonder what would happen if I wired this branch to cross that trunk, uh, you know? And yeah. so for this tree, this had this opportunity to move in this direction, give the tree a feel that it didn't possess at the beginning of this demonstration. It would have been very easy to wire the tree like that, right? It would have been very boring too. You would have looked at it and thought, mm, yeah. Okay. Yeah. When this is done, I have a feeling that you're going to really like what it's going to yeah. look like. Uh, when, when push comes to shove, most of the better type of bones on your pen don't follow the rules. They don't follow the rules. Yeah. No. They utilize the natural characteristics of the tree. I'll never forget this. Uh, there's a client from Hokkaido. In Hokkaido, they have spruce, the best, some of the best spruce in the world. And they're collected out of bogs. And there is this tree that had a branch that crossed right over the front of the trunk. And Mr. Kimura said, take this spruce and style it. And he would do this occasionally. He would buy a real crappy tree at auction and come home and say, this is the best tree I bought, and it cost billions of dollars. <laughs> Wire it, don't screw it up, you know? And I always knew that he was just putting pressure on me, and it only cost like maybe 50 bucks. But uh, the, the fact that he was giving me, me the opportunity to style a raw tree was a, a tremendous opportunity for me. Um, 
anyways, he gave me this spruce, and it had a branch that ran right across the front of the trunk. And I asked him, I said, uh, is this the front of the tree? And he said, I don't know, you decide. And so because it was running across the front of the tree, I chose the back of the tree as the front, which was completely and totally uninteresting, but I was letting that one characteristic dictate everything about that tree. And in the end, I set it on his turntable so that he could take a look at it, critique it, adjust it, and he said, man, it would have been so much better <laughs> if you'd used this other front. And I just felt like, you know, stabbing him in the eye with my scissors because <laughs> I'd asked him, you know, I'd asked him, and, uh, and, his, and his comment was, you know, choose it yourself. And there had been times where he had said, you know, you can't do that, that branch crosses the front. But I think every tree is different, and if you can't, if you can't address each tree for what individually makes it um, unique and, and interesting, uh, then it's very difficult to, to create good bone yeah. Um And so what is the... <laughs> what is the characteristic of that tree which you are are enhancing with that then? What is the characteristic of this tree? That is the characteristic of this tree. That branch is what's going to make this tree special. Yeah. So this is just another ponderosa with rugged bark and a, and a piece of shari up the trunk. You know, I work with ponderosa every day. I've wired several hundred ponderosa in the past uh, 12 months. Any time that I can utilize something to be creative and make something that I don't readily see, I try to take that opportunity. And character branches, there's, there's a thing about bonsai that, a lot, that we don't readily realize in the United States. And I've seen this almost every place I've gone. And the most dramatic example was Florida. I was in Florida earlier this year. They had this massive buttonwood. Maybe you guys saw it was on YouTube, or there's something about it on YouTube. I, the, the buttonwood was this big. It was gigantic. When I stood behind it, you couldn't see me, you couldn't hear me, you didn't even know somebody was there, right? And they said, okay, you got two hours, style it, okay? So, the, the buttonwood had this big, beautiful branch out of the top, it was a big, thick double trunk, okay? It had this big, beautiful branch coming out of the top. All the other branches were kind of thin and small, and this big, beautiful, gnarly branch coming out of the top. And that was the character of the tree. So I utilized that branch, and I could not get out of that room without people being upset that I didn't cut it off. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And so I don't think, I don't think that um, from time to time, I don't think that we readily understand what makes a bone tie enjoyable for us to look, look at, because I don't think that we've ever had to quantify it. But when we look at trees in Japan that we find to be ultimately appealing, I guarantee you it's probably a tree that has something unique about it, that's something different than what you've seen. Mm -hmm. Well, also, uh, uh, um, one of, of of the characteristics of the of the species in nature is that often it will end up awfully contorted. Absolutely. Um, and so, so in this, why you're going with with one of the characteristics of the species? Well, I'm going. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going with the, sort of one of the characteristics of, of yeah the natural environment. That's coming on. But it's not like you can just take every tree and then just wrap right. a branch around the trunk and yeah. be like, ah. right. I created something great now. <laughs> it's not really yeah. that on, that on this occasion. This is why bone science shouldn't be written in books with uh, you know black and white answers, and and should not be taught by people that that don't comprehend the full scope of, of, of what what an interesting bone site can be. Because there's a lot of people out there that say that's wrong, that's incorrect. It's like, have you ever seen a tree that's interesting that does look like that? You know, and, and there's a lot of people out there that haven't, and that's. That's really hard for somebody like that to be teaching bonsai if they haven't experienced a full sort of spectrum or scope of interesting shapes and sizes. I really, I really admired the fact that Mr. Kimura never functioned off of a fundamental principle. There is something in Japan called the orthodox style, right? Orthodox. They would say orthodox. But right, the orthodox style is the one branch, two branch, three branch, mm -hmm. informal upright outer portion of the curve. That doesn't mean that every tree that conforms to the orthodox style meets that, but that's a fundamental principle that's used to create that style. Okay, to the best of your ability with the branches being where they are and the tree being what it is, that's a consideration when you style those trees. And what was I talking about? Orthodox. Orthodox. <laughs> I 
totally lost it. Mm -hmm. um, and so what you're doing is you are are ignoring one of the surface rules um, in in the pursuit of something interesting. Yeah, uh, um, and and upholding a a deeper artistic idea. Um, um, or am I getting a little too? You're going too far. <laughs> too far. So I used to I used to sit and think while I was wiring, and I always tried to think how would I quantify what I'm trying to do when I work on trees. And uh, in layman's terms, if I try to quantify what I'm doing with this tree, I'm trying to make it look badass. That's it. I, I don't have any deeper meaning. I don't have anything except for the fact that I don't want this to look like a regular tree. You guys don't want to see this look like a regular tree. If you want to see this look like a regular tree, you could have somebody else up here, right? I could be up there. You could be up there. <laughs> could come up and help. <laughs> that branch you cut off early, was that just to uh, increase the taper along that part if you're wondering, you just didn't want the light? Okay, so taper, right? So we talked about this idea of taper when we were judging trees and uh, this fundamental concept that, that uh, branch structure and taper is a very significant aspect. But when we're dealing with conifers, it's slightly different than when we're considering deciduous trees, right? Deciduous trees, you can see the full expanse of a branch for at least a quarter of the year, potentially a third of the year, and in some places a half of the year, right? And so that becomes important. That's a significant aspect of the visual quality of that tree. When we're talking about a conifer, we have this uh, amazing thing called evergreen foliage that hides most of the structure of the tree year round. And so, as opposed to considering, all right, let's improve branch taper as being my conscious thought, I was thinking this is gonna be too long and too big for this part of the tree based on the fact that I'm trying to get the flow to move this way. Right? So if I have a big strong branch contradicting that, I'm defeating the purpose of why I brought this branch around the bottom of the trunk. Okay? I heard yawns. I heard a big yawn. <laughs> that was a sigh. Because it's getting dark in here. Yeah? I heard that, uh, I've kind of noticed that you haven't cut many branches off right. of it at this point. We're, we're in a process in your mind does that fit in? Does that, if you look at it at the beginning, decide which branch stays, which branch goes, branch okay. goes, good. or do you wait until the end of the decide that? Good question. So, however, one thing that I want to point out that I'm kind of happy that you noticed that is, when we're working with trees, you're dealing with branches that are hundreds of years old, right? So to just go through and, and then uh, it'll grow back. It's a really, really irresponsible way to work on trees. And I think because we have an abundance of material in the United States, and maybe this is different from region to region, but I, I think that there's a, a bit of a lack of respect for what we're dealing with. And when I, when I style a raw tree, I generally try to use everything that I can. Even if there's a smaller tree that can be created, even if there's even if there are branches that I don't like, I'll try to find a way to use them unless they um, negatively impact the design because of the fact that there's there's another reason in that because of the fact that this is the manner in which this tree survives this is the solar panel that generates the resources that drive the, the, the continual uh, perpetuation of life in this tree and so if I the more I reduce this on a tree that's this old the more I'm reducing this tree's ability to respond positively to this design to develop past this design and to continue to be healthy so we have a responsibility. I mean, I hate to uh, put the looming cloud of um, parenting or um, responsibility that we're all trying to escape by doing bonsai, but <laughs> we do have a responsibility to these trees. And particularly when we decide that we're going to own a tree collected out of the mountains that's hundreds of years old that we could have left there or we could have not purchased because we didn't... Um, feel like we wanted to take on the responsibility of caring for that thing, uh, once we make that, once we take that step and we have that responsibility, uh, I fully expect students that I'm working with to, to respect and appreciate that. Um, so I think it needs a, a decent amount of consideration before we, we kind of take that leap. I understand that ponderosas are starting to be imported in Japan. 
What, what's the general take on the ponderosas in Japan? Also? There's no reason that ponderosas would be imported in Japan. They are being. Uh, who's sending them? I was told Andy Smith. No. <laughs> No, it's not happening. Like recently, hmm. um, I don't, I don't believe it. I wouldn't think they'd cope with it. Uh, it's not that they wouldn't cope with it. Japan has no desire for this. Why would they want a ponderosa pine? You had mentioned so, reducing the needle size on these, uh, and how to go about doing that. Uh huh. So, <laughs> so I said the number one way to reduce the size of needles was by increasing the amount of foliage, increasing the photosynthetic resources. Okay, so the more needles we have on this tree, the more the tree's energy is distributed amongst those needles, okay. right? And the less the tree feels it needs to provide itself with the surface area of one single individual needle to photosynthesize. So you got to remember. Needle length is just dictating how much photosynthetic surface area this tree needs to capture the amount of energy and light that are necessary for its sustainability. Right? If it's got a ton of needles, a ton of buds, those needles are going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. The more we pluck those needles, the more we remove that foliage, the more we cut off branches, the more we reduce that photosynthetic mass, the less this tree is going to be able to function efficiently and the, the larger the needle mass or the, the needle size is going to get. Where did you end up, Brian? Where did I end up? You still oh. grow these. What's that? I wish you, you still you still can grow these. So me, I'm in I'm outside of Portland, Oregon. Okay. I'm in the place where you can grow anything, and it rains a lot. <laughs> Too much. <laughs> um, at, uh, uh, all that rain um, uh, on a uh, 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 um, a dry land tree like Ponderosa. Is, is liable to be a problem? Um, so that, that's been a, a, a very common thought and a common question that's asked to me. Is this, is this uh, detrimental to a ponderosa pine? And in fact, it's not. Um, if you consider plants, right? Plants grow where they grow, not because they like to grow there, but because that's where they could grow without other species of plants out competing them. <clears throat> and so a ponderosa pine doesn't choose a dry, desiccated, uh, hot, crappy hillside. Right, or a slab of granite. However, that's where a ponderosa pine can go and grow in peace. Mm -hmm. And so that's why they grow where they grow. Ponderosa pine prefer temperatures between uh, 76 and 84 degrees. Right? If you want to talk about its prime sweet spot for maximum growth and ultimate happiness, that's where it thrives. And they like moisture, and the healthier that a tree gets, and the more needle mass that a tree develops, the more water it's going to want to use. So I have ponderosa pines that utilize as much water as any deciduous tree in the nursery. I've got ponderosa pines that utilize as much moisture as any juniper in the nursery. And, and it, if you have a healthy ponderosa pine, it will absolutely consume moisture. Rain has never been a problem. <clears throat> Uh, I have had the opportunity, unfortunately, to work on red pines. <laughs> why, is, why do you say that? Red <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Red pines are my arch nemesis. Inevitably, I would get a red pine and break it. And uh, red pines are very, very brittle. Uh, red pines are known as the feminine pine in Japan. So you've got black pine, which is masculine, red pine, which is feminine, and white pine, which must be unisex. I don't know. But um, the, the red pine is extremely brittle for the most part. And there are flexible red pines, but for the most part, very, very brittle, very, very um, soft needles, and has a very thin, sparse look for the most part. Plus, it's got that really furled, um, flaking bark. But uh, two of the three work, not three of the four, no, two of the four worst experiences I had in Japan were based on the fact that I was working on red pines. And so I have a hard time looking at them fondly, but. Um, you don't know when they're going to break, you don't know how they're going to break, but you can always anticipate the fact that they're going to break. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, I was sitting in the workshop, still in my first year, and I was at night, and the other apprentices hadn't come. Maybe Mr. Kimura had said not come, and I just didn't understand Japanese, mm -hmm. uh, which is really, really possible. 
um, or maybe they just decided not to come, but it was me and him in the workshop, and he had this very, very expensive red pine, super expensive tree, very awesome, nice, old, and there was a big, beautiful character branch on this tree that hung down and had all these curves and twists and was super old, and he needed to move that branch out away from the trunk, and so he was putting wire on it. And he asked me to pull a portion of that branch to the side so that he could thread wire through it. And of course, you know what happened. Mm. I broke the whole branch off. Mm. This entire big, massive, beautiful branch on this, you know, tens of thousands of dollar tree. Completely ruined. Mm. I destroyed it. And so I'm sitting there with the branch in my hand. <laughs> and he's looking at me, and I'm looking at the branch, and then I look at him and down at the branch again. And that was the first time that he said, well, I guess we got to forget that that, 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 that that ever existed. And uh, over the years, as we went through all of these dramatic stylings and things like that would happen, um, that, that was inevitably his motto, because he used to always say, you can't, you can't work on tree with fear. You can't work on a tree with fear. You've got to make a commitment to a design, and you've got to do everything necessary to make that the realization of that design successful. And so if that means going to a point where you're going to kill a tree, that means that you're trying hard enough. He used to say, if you're not killing trees, you're not trying hard enough. Hmm. And so a lot of people would hear that and say, ah, oh, that man is such a butcher. But quite the contrary, I, I, think that, I think that Mr. Kimura was somebody, he used to also always say, if I can, if I can, if I can make this tree... If I know I can make this tree look this good, but I'm going to push it within an inch of its life, or I'm always going to look at it and it's going to look this good, but I'm going to know that I could have always reached this potential. I'm going to risk that tree's life out of respect to make that tree look as good as it possibly can. So, you know, take your pick. I, 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 gen I tell that story everywhere I go, because inevitably when we're working on trees, there come a time when we have to make a decision and come to terms with what we're trying to accomplish and whether it's realistic. And as long as you have the confidence and the ability and the knowledge of the techniques and also are capable of providing it with the aftercare, um, I try to separate myself from being afraid to do things all the time. And, and um, he always taught us to compensate for that. That branch didn't exist, now we've got to style this tree and make it look better than it did when it had that branch. And that's what we did with that tree. Here you lose the most important tree on this red pine. I'm pretty sure it's ruined. And he takes it, and he makes it look ten times better. The customer was so excited, he thought Mr. Kimura had intentionally taken that branch off. <laughs> and thought he was a genius for doing it. Like, nobody in the bonsai world would have ever taken that branch off. <laughs> True, right? How could you? Unless your apprentice ripped it off. <laughs> it's a poor apprentice trick. When he makes these really dramatic moves, like splitting, splitting branches and moving them up 360 degrees, all this kind of stuff. What is the success rate? 95%. Oh my God. But that's not because, see, the, the misconception is, is that he's, he's got some magic power or he's capable of this or that. The, 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 make no mistake, his he knowledge... He knows get away with. What's that? He does know what he can get away with. He knows what he can get away with, but his knowledge of horticulture and aftercare is what allows him to do that. People think that it's in the technique, and it is. It's in the technique. But aftercare, if you can't provide a tree with proper aftercare, and if you don't have a tree that's healthy prior to doing that stuff, you've already lost the battle, even before you've begun. I think in the United States, we have a bit of a misconception of what health is. Right? We see trees that have big, beautiful crowns and tons of uh, strong, growing shoots, and we think, ah, oh, this tree is healthy. Right? But any, any application of miracle Grow or Osmocote or some, you know, high high power chemical brand of fertilizer can generate that same response without really having generated <clears throat> strong health and realistic sustainable growth. And uh, Mr. Kimura understood what health was. All of the trees in his nursery were very healthy, very capable of standing that kind of work. And once they went through that kind of work, um, they were very capable of recovering from that kind of work. And so. I think, I think there's a, a significant misconception about why he's successful with that. And he does know how far he can go. And he always pushed himself past that point. But then he provided the aftercare to compensate for it. Inevitably, when we were bending something big and uh, something that you probably shouldn't be considering bending, and most people would think was stupid and out of uh, this, this world questionable, um, he would get it to a point where it was sex successful and it would look great. And then he would have to bend it a little bit more. Right? He always had to bend it more. And inevitably it would break. And you would think, why would you do that when you got to this point? He wanted to see if he could just push it a little bit farther. 
So then it would break and we would have to go through this long drawn out process of creating a condition in an environment in which even though he pushed it too far, he could still have success. Ryan, how do you develop really good health of the true alpha massive use of fertilizer? You use, the, you use the right fertilizer. And you fertilize with the correct intentions. So growth, <coughs> it's, it's, it's a misunderstood concept to say growth and health are the same thing. Growth and health are not the same thing, right? A tree has to grow. If it doesn't grow, it dies. If a tree isn't green, it dies. So if we say if a tree is green, it's alive. No, green is the last to go, right? Green is the last to go. It has to photosynthesize. A tree, true health, resistance to disease, resistance to pests, resistance to cold, tolerance of heat, resistance to drought, ability to endure difficult conditions, physical abuse by owners, right? Urine by dogs. Whatever it's going to be, bones I have to be able to tolerate it. That's health. That's strength. So proper soil. Proper soil. Proper water. Proper fertilizer.